Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Ella Pravis, and I'm joined here today by Shox and Yamato. Thank you guys so much for being here. No problemo. My pleasure. The first question, of course, is both how are all of you during the time of quarantine? You I'll go, go first. I'll go first. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm okay. I mean, as as well as as you can be under the circumstances. I think, of course, um, we are relatively lucky uh, that you know we have kind of our flats, and I want to say the internet, but it like often doesn't work. So <laughs> that would definitely make me happier. But it's all right. It's mentally pretty draining, I have to admit. But yeah. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I, it's 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 hard to complain knowing what's going on. Like I know people have it worse, but it's definitely like draining in a very strange way. It's like uh, it's hard to have the same amount of discipline as uh, right. in the past because the process of like I kind of miss taking that one and a half hour S bahn ride to, to the LEC because it was it, there's something very very um, well, what's the right word? It, it feels like it's psychologically beneficial. Uh, yeah. Just to sit there and yeah. just go through the motions of uh, getting ready, because now it's like I wake up five minutes before I have to be in the meeting, and I have to like pretend that I'm I'm ready to go. <laughs> but it's working so far. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think stripping yourself of that routine is generally pretty hard, and it's kind of hard to rebuild yeah. something. Have either of you guys you know, picked up any hobbies in the meantime, or different things to kind of put into those spaces? I know I have. Um, I, so I watch a lot of shows, uh, no matter what, but I have this thing where I feel overwhelmed by choice regularly. I don't know if other people have that, but it's like, oh, there's all this stuff you have to watch on Amazon and on, I don't know, just Twitch, just streamers and then on Netflix and all that stuff. And I ended up just kind of not watching anything because of it, which sounds really weird, but I know there's studies about that. It's like the abundance yeah, of choice. Lot, yeah. So mm -hmm. now I'm going down the list of everything that is, um, that you have to watch, but that I haven't watched. Like I stopped watching Westworld for some reason. So I'm picking that back up. Um, mm. I just got my switch. So I am finally <laughs> in the Animal yes. Crossing world. Um, yes. But for the rest, yeah. I've also started doing some dance routines from like YouTube videos because I find it really hard to move. I think that's actually the hardest thing because I just sit here or there or in my bed. So yeah. Yeah. I just, on my end, it's like with the, with the time that uh, like there's so much time and I'm stressing myself out because it always feels like I'm not doing enough. It's like it doesn't feel like there is no clear structure to the day. There's no beginning, no end, no, no middle. So it's like I, I'm always in the constant state of like wanting to be in motion. So when I slow down, I still feel stressed out. This is something that I'm mm -hmm. trying to like monitor, especially with like, like going into freelance this year. It was probably like the most troll year to do it. And uh, oh, I saw trying that to, of yours. <laughs> you know, yeah. trying to <laughs> build like a floor under the carpet that is all the events. You know, it's mm -hmm. uh, just trying to make sure that there is some sense of safety. So there's like so much to do in terms of content and what you can do. Right. And that kind of, I, once again, the abundance of choice. I'm sitting there and kind of stressing myself out over the amount of uh, content you can do and can't do and choices and so forth. But uh, it's uh, going forward. That's the only thing I want. So I can't once again complain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just want to, sorry to interrupt, but uh, no, that's go a good point. The whole like, yeah, not feeling, and I need that structure because um, I don't know, I don't wake up unless I'm sitting on that train and I have to go somewhere and I get cracking and do all those things. And now it's just, yeah, I make some instant coffee there and I sit down and I'm like totally zoned out. And I also think that people, you're so available all the time. And I think when people know that you're physically at work, they don't mm. tend to bother you outside of those hours that much, I guess, or like inside, depending on like if it's your work or your family. And now it's like it's this one big bubble of everyone, you know, messaging yeah. everyone constantly and there's not really private time. And then your friends from LA wake up and they message you and you want to answer everybody because you want to stay connected, but it's, it's a mess. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, agree. It's definitely, definitely stressful times. And definitely, I think routine is super important though, as you're both saying, like those little things, like, you know, finding the exercise or finding the way to kind of replace those little moments of like when you took the train or when you did X, Y, Z, or even creating that kind of private space for yourself, I think, or when you're like not responding to people versus when you are. Um, Shox, you mentioned picking up Animal Crossing, which is yeah. also my fave game. And I noticed <laughs> that you <laughs> you tweeted, you're like, oh, I haven't seen, you know, I don't see Tom Nook as evil yet. But then you showed a picture of your itemized bill from him. 
Have yeah. You, are you beginning to share the sentiment that you think he's a, a capitalist crook or, you know, um, are you still on board? So apparently he was worse in the previous games is what I hear from like the Animal Crossing aficionados. Uh, mm. But now I think it's logical. I mean, I don't know how much in the end did I choose to pay to go on this thing? Because it seems like I did. That's like left ambiguous. But it seems like I was looking for a way out of my miserable life and I wanted to be on this island. So he's doing me a favor <laughs> for now. Plus, he's giving me free stuff. I can use his workbench for free. Is he going to come back and say every time you've used the workbench? Don't spoil it. But like, I need to pay for it because <laughs> I'm using that thing all the time. I'm just going in there and, oh, it's so much fun. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm not at that point yet. But I've, I have did notice he has no interest. So I'm hoping there's no loophole on the loans there. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I want to talk a little bit about your both of your kind of like career paths and trajectory in your personal life. So I want to start with you, Shox. Um, you've always been someone to me who struck themselves as incredibly passionate, professional, and curious about your work. You're always, you know, ask in my opinion, you're always asking more questions, curious. You know, even when I was working backstage, you'd be like, what are you doing? How did you get into this? That kind of stuff. What kind of research do you do every week to prepare yourself for a week on broadcast? Like, what is your process behind that? Um, well, it did change significantly from going freelance because within Riot, there's a very institutionalized um, feedback system, um, which I, I liked because of the structure, but sometimes I was like, oh, do I have to write a review again? <laughs> but it is actually really, really good because, um, yeah, you're just forced to keep tabs on yourself and there's goals to work towards and you can talk to your colleagues about it. And as freelance, I do find that more difficult. Um, however, when it comes to the LEC, and I've had conversations with Quickshot about, with Trevor about this, is like, we could probably do the show with our eyes closed. And that makes it sometimes tricky because... You know, if you don't do the prep, you'd probably still do a good job. So it becomes harder to do it efficiently the longer you've been in it. Um, but for me as a host, it's more about everything around it, right? So watch the VODs, um, look at the interviews and kind of think about the angles at which you can approach each topic and also talk to your analysts during rehearsal and before and see what they want to be cued for. Yamato is great. He always says, um, hey, can you cue me for this or this or this? <laughs> um, so that's awesome. Um, in terms of kind of self feedback, there's of course VOD review, just watching your own VODs back, um, asking other people too, and setting goals before every week. Like last week, uh, we set some goals for the analyst desks, then we checked if we actually hit those or not. Um, and when it comes to new things, because LEC has said, I know, but for instance, Counter-Strike, which is a game that I don't know that much about, then before an event, I really, really study. I just study my ass off. I basically like... Yeah, I um, watch every single VOD of every single team in there. I talk to all the experts. I try and conduct interviews with people, with casters. I look at HLTV and stuff like that. So anything that's new, I try to be, I try to study as much as possible because that feeling of, you know what, wherever we go, I'll be able to hold my own. Uh, that's the most important thing for me. Yeah. Just kind of having that faith in yourself that yeah. you know you can, yep. That makes sense. Do you ever find if you're constantly reviewing VODs, how do you kind of battle with that? Um, I'm sure there's a probably a desire, a tendency to want to be really self-critical when you're looking at that kind of stuff. How do you kind of balance the ability to stay constructive with it, but not get too in your head about it? Uh, that's a tricky one because obviously there's this thing called Twitter and Reddit. And, um, <laughs> and the thing is that they do often have good criticism. It's just that it's buried under this layer of bullshit. Can I say that? <laughs> yeah, you often. Can say that. Um, so I get... Yeah, I can actually watch myself pretty well. I know a lot of broadcasters and people that do voice stuff say, oh, I can't listen to myself. I can, I'm fine. I can watch myself. I <laughs> Like, I get annoyed, but it's fine. Um, I'm entertained by myself, which I guess is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's good to set just goals before and then um, look at things in the lens of those goals and not necessarily at every little thing, uh, as well mm -hmm. as take criticism from your peers and people you trust and have like that circle of people because... No matter how good people mean it, feedback is a very intricate thing. And in essence, you should only, you know, work closely with it when there's people who know how you want to receive that feedback, because I'm not good with bluntness during a show, for instance. Trevor is very good with that. You can go up to him and say, Trevor, you completely sucked in that segment because of this, 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 and this, and he'll take it on and immediately implement it. But I'm not like that. You know, I have... The you know, you have to talk to me after the show and just explain and give me an example and stuff like that. So yeah, um, putting structures in place is important, I think. 
yeah, I guess knowing yourself too in that situation and how you react to everything is super important as well. Yeah. Um, Yamato, speaking of being on broadcast, you've kind of come from being a player to a coach to now being on air talent. Which do you like the most? And also what was the leading decision or factor behind the decision to actually transfer to being on air? Um, honestly, it's, um, it's, it's hard to choose what I like the most because it's so different. You know, I've been very privileged that I could do both this entire time. And um, uh, my situation with Vitality, they put me in a position like basically we had, I had a two year contract. They decided to make uh, like a choice to make changes very late into um, which uh, November. And uh, already at that point in time, uh, most teams that I was interested in just had a coaching staff and uh, uh, working full time with the broadcast was something that I always had in the back of my mind because whenever I had uh, the opportunity to to visit as uh, like on the analyst desk or whether it was at finals, I always liked the atmosphere. I liked working with everyone. It was always something that was very refreshing because in contrast to coaching, I have to be responsible for everyone. and. Uh, there was a sense of relief uh, working in the environment where I could just focus on myself, even though we're a team, uh, focus on how I deliver things and so forth. There is a great relief in that. But I also find myself missing the responsibility of having like, you know, the responsibility of every player and the team on my shoulders. So it's, it's hard to kind of define it. But uh, mm. now going through the motions, like casting, the best of five with Trevor, uh, that was like amazing. That was like an experience I'm going to remember for like the longest time ever. Not only because it was like the biggest upset ever, it was just exciting in its own right. And uh, for me, it's uh, just about collecting different experiences. I think uh, it was the same for me when it came to choosing teams. I always wanted to make sure that uh, I grow somehow. And it's always been like in line with my decision in terms of choosing to work with the team or not. It was like, can I create an experience here that is going to be memorable and something that is going to shape me in a positive way? And that's usually what uh, I just draw myself to. So I, don't, I wouldn't say I have a specific preference, but I can say that I re really miss that big responsibility on my shoulders because I feel like I thrive in it somehow. As a freelancer, do you feel like you have that ability to grow in the same way? What's the feedback structure look like? Because I'm going to presume, I don't know this, but Shocks, when you were, as you were just saying, full time there, you had a lot more reviews and a process for kind of growing. What does that look like for someone like Yamato right now who's working as a freelancer who gets brought in, especially during this time? I mean, you can ask him, uh, but <laughs> I, I would say it's like there is a structure in place, but it isn't as forcefully, um, I think, implemented yet to freelancers i think that's the impression i get but there is that kind of ask to set goals and let trevor and the team trevor manages the casters as you guys know and uh, freelancers in terms of kind of performance and stuff like that um that is in place but there isn't that much i would say as much pressure as there was full time but yeah i i don't think yamato can compare obviously but i think uh, on my end i think i've noticed that you you just have to seek it you have to always, always, you know, uh, look for that feedback. You need to kind of force it out of people sometimes. And I think in what I've noticed in the freelance business is being used to working in an organization, you have like people that you can rely on with certain things and it's been very different being in a position where I get to shape my entire day. And I think, uh, you know, uh, the most stressful part about it is like working freelance and of course, there isn't uh, like a vast sea of work that you can do right now. It's more about I'm, uh, I'm very happy that LEC is continuing. And I think that's like probably the, the biggest blessing uh, through, through all of this. But at the same time, just the amount of content that I want to push out. I think I like the last four months, which is like my freelance time, it, I've maybe like posted maybe 200 videos in total on YouTube. And that's just like the sheer volume of it. And it still doesn't feel like it's enough. Just a question right. of like, you have the possibility to do so, so much, but it's hard to see the limitation. And I've noticed like even the last days, especially now during the quarantine, that I'm almost like burning myself out. And um, I think uh, just just the, the option and the fear of what could be is always something that is uh, annoying at the back of my head. But in terms of just, just the feedback, I think, especially in, in content creation, feeling the temperature of the community is what I've noticed is the most important thing, because if, if you notice the trend of conversation is uh, in a specific direction, like how good is Cloud9 versus the LEC teams, you have to like 
push yourself in that direction and put your own spin on it. And this is something that I'm learning. And also in terms of casting, uh, as much as um, I hate to admit it, the, the public perception is super, super key in, in everything. And appeasing to that just a little bit and putting your own spin on it is, is super key because I think you can find like just the right balance and finding that balance mm -hmm. is the trickiest part. Yeah, I can imagine it would be, especially having to take in all of that feedback constantly and again, like filter yeah. through it, kind of like you were saying earlier, shocks to, mm -hmm. you know, not take too much to heart, but take enough that you can actually adapt and listen to what the audience needs. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of brings me to the next question, shocks. How would you compare early in your career shocks, like just starting out to shocks now? And what would you tell yourself if you could talk to your early self when you were just starting out? Um, so something that I realized, and I think probably is the case for most people, but you can't push confidence. Like you can't push your own development of confidence. And in the beginning, there was often times where I felt, oh, if I'd just been more confident and went for this, I would have been so much better. Um, but it's just not something you're going to pick up from one day or another. And there's other people, right? Like I can imagine maybe a motto is probably confident straight out of the womb, but <laughs> I like I wasn't in the beginning. And um, I think a lot of that comes with knowing how to laugh at knowing to laugh at yourself, because other people will do it anyway. And um, knowing that you have trust in your own ability. So even if you mess up, you're gonna be fine. Maybe it'd be a boring moment, or maybe it's a meme. And then it's a win win, because then you know, you get Twitter fame or whatever. So um, like the word, there's nothing that can happen when you prepare that will be so terrible normally, right? But it's very hard to tell your younger self that um, saying, you know, in two years, it'll be much better. And in another two years, it'll be much, much better. And you'll grow as a person. And you're because I was like, oh, I, I'm like 25. What? I don't have any growing up to do. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the. Yeah, just the fact that confidence will come with years and just practicing and everyone makes mistakes and you should just laugh at yourself um, is, I, yeah, I still struggle with it sometimes, but it's important. I love that. I see that though. That's so present in your in your Twitter profile, especially when you're constantly <laughs> laughing at yourself and engaging with the audience. No, but I love it. It's super relatable and endearing. I, I think you're, you're dead on there. Um, I was listening to an interview you did with Trevor. It was one where you guys are both on the couch side to side and you described yourself early on in your career is incredibly emotional, but you almost did it in a, a negative light. And which I thought was interesting because I always saw that the emotion and passion was one of the you know, driving factors in your work that sets you apart. So I was worrying, wondering, how have you learned to harness that aspect of yourself to inform your work without letting it interfere with your interpersonal work relationships? Um, well, there's, whew, okay, I'm going to try and summarize this. Um, so first, <laughs> yeah, up, that's a big... first is um, kind of the professional and the, the side that shows in my work. Um, you know, the Dyrus interview, the Perks interview, the Amato interview um, after the Elimination at Worlds and stuff like that is always that key of like, the interview is not about me because that's what people always say. And I think that's true. It's about the guest, but it's it does help if you show your emotion a little bit sometimes, you know, but it has to be just right. And that's very, very, yeah, that's a precarious ba balance, I think. Um, so I just said, you know what, in those moments, I will not cry because it's not about me, even if I feel like crying, but then sometimes it kind of does happen. But I have felt that sometimes it's fine to show that emotion because many people are probably feeling it as well, as long as it doesn't impact kind of your performance in the rest of the interview or the show, or it doesn't influence the person you're interviewing, but there's a time and a place for everything. Um, now in my intrapersonal, work relationships, um, it actually was so that I'm still a very emotional person, but I said I was much younger also, and I had never worked in a team. So if I was having a bad day and I, I talked about my sleeping issues and I have, you know, anxiety because of that. And the insomnia makes me feel very up and down, uh, mood swingy, mentally in bad places very often. But I would bring that within the team and kind of exude it on everybody and not notice. So if I was having a bad day, everyone was having a bad day um, because I would be snappy and harsh and I would not realize it from myself at all mm -hmm. to a point where, um, yeah, there was actually a very difficult conversation where I, you know, I was almost out the door uh, with my manager, Dirk, and with Trevor, where they said, hey, we appreciate you as an asset very much and as a person and the work you do. But it's coming to a point where these emotions you're bringing in are disrupting, you know, a lot of relationships. And they were careful because 
as said, emotion is not a bad thing. And it's also important, the fire in the meetings and all that, but there's a limit, you know, I can't just come in and someone ask me something, bark their heads off because I don't feel well. Um, so that relationship has fostered a lot also with the people at LEC and I'm eternally grateful because now we're, or I'm in a place where I can go to them and say, Hey, I'm in a really, really bad place, uh, because I've not slept or this or that. And mm -hmm. if I'm being snappy with anyone, just please tell me. And people just tell me, but it's in a very nice way. And I realize, like, hopefully I think so. Yamada is going to say that I still <laughs> bite his head off maybe sometimes, <laughs> but, um, no, no, I, no. I can control <laughs> it more, but, um, yeah, that's also one of those things that you're sometimes you don't realize what you're doing and someone needs to tell you, but yeah. they have to be careful in telling you it's tricky. Yeah. It's hard to take someone, just especially if it's something that feels so, you know, like you can't control it necessarily at first. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, you've, yeah, anytime you get feedback like that at work or something, right. You're just kind of like, Oh my God, like this is how I've been functioning my whole life. How yeah. is this, you know, now I know what I was doing to my that? mom as a teenager, like, Oh God. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right exactly. Because this is a question, we'll start with your motto, but we're going to start asking all of our guests, which is, what is your worst esports story? Ooh. Ooh. Well, I think <laughs> um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind was just uh, my first experience as a player, uh, like in the LCS, which is what it was called at the time, the European League. I was part of Dragonborns, which was uh, Shushay's team. But honestly, I can think of even worse. Probably the worst was <laughs> was uh, was Team Solo Mebdi. So basically, Team Solo Mebdi was my team with um, with Jensen, which who is in Team Liquid now, and uh, Darkwin Jax was uh, crowned the, the most toxic player to have ever graced the Summoners Rift. And um, we made a team together. And um, at the time, like people thought I was crazy, but I made sure, like with Riot Games and everything, that uh, everyone was like clear. No one, we wouldn't get banned, nothing. Everyone was clear as long as uh, we wouldn't get tribunal banned, which was like the system that was in place. Like people could report and then there was a tribunal where people voted whether a person should get banned or not. So they told us if we don't get banned, we're going to be fine for the tournament. And uh, we practiced for like a month. We qualified and we were like ready. We were like destroying everybody in practice. Everything was going super, super well. And then we had our boot camp. We had like the coin flip the day before, and then we were at the airport, at the airport. And uh, I think at the time, I think it was uh, Mark Merrill, I don't know his position. He called me up and said, uh, you guys are, are banned from the tournament, <laughs> just at the airport. I, I don't even know how he got my number. He just had my number. He called me up, you're banned. Uh, three of your players had been tribunal banned. I was like, where are the tribunal cases? And uh, it was just nothing. We just got banned because I think... They kind of realized that it was a wrong decision in the first place that we should have played. And I think there was some confusion between like you and NA. And then it ended up like being there at the final moment. Because I think um, it was just like a snap decision that, uh, oh, these guys can't be representing the LCS. It would be crazy because we were like the epitome of, of you know, you know, craziness at the time. So I didn't get banned, you know, God bless. They told me, oh, we have good news for you. You are one of the most positive summoners on the Rift. I was like, yeah, that's fantastic here at the airport. The traveling five hours <laughs> so it was uh, the only positive side notes and uh that's probably like the, my biggest horror story because three days before that they were actually trolling me so we, we, had, we were boot camping and they, they logged in on every pc on one of their permaband accounts it's like Yamaro, we got permaband and i got so upset because i paid for the boot camp we put so many hours into it <laughs> and then darkwin just started giggling and he was like ah we just we're just fucking with you we're just trolling you and uh, then it turned out we got banned for real which uh, is ironic <laughs> <laughs> that is erotic. At least you were positive, though. Points for positivity. Yeah. And now it's easier. Oh, seven God. years later. <laughs> seven years. <laughs> what about you, Shucks? Um, I don't like no. Because also, I mean, truth be told, I am looking to not throw anyone under the bus in terms of like, That's oh, I worked with these people and they were absolute garbage. I, <laughs> <laughs> I respect um, that. I respect that. Uh, for myself, though, I think it was. Um, I mean, there's a lot of moments where like I do stupid stuff like last finals, I had to talk in French and apparently you don't say 2020 in French like you don't say va va. It's apparently ridiculous. And I said it 17 <laughs> times and then, yeah, you go on Twitter. It's like, oh, I don't have to check this. I know what this is. Nope. Um, and then there was this world. It must have been uh, worlds in China. That's 2017. Yeah. 
uh, must have been, I guess, Gen G, like Samsung one. And Worlds is like this hugely stressful endeavor because you get so many more eyes on you than normally, um, you know, from all around the world. Like people who don't watch NALCS or whatever, or EULCS would watch that. And then maybe they see you for the first time or whatever. And there's only snippets. Like your time is so limited in interviews because that's the only time people see you and it's four questions and it's if that's not good then shit right um so the final interview uh, who was it with i don't know but the final interview with one of the winners so this literally the most important thing i had to do and the only thing i had to do that day and the thing is that we've implemented a system where sometimes it goes live to tape which means um you have to treat it like it's live but it gets immediately recorded and then played two minutes later or three minutes later so they can time it, um, et cetera. Because the the thing is the players aren't as readily available because at Worlds, everyone wants to interview them. So you got to take them when you can get them. And I was under that impression. So I do this winner interview and in the second question, I just stop and I go, oh, oh my God, so stupid. Yeah, I messed up. Ugh, stop, stop, let's roll again, let's roll again. And then I get like, we can't, we already took it live at a world final. And I was like, <laughs> just kidding, guys. And then I have like this Korean player next to me who's looking at me like I'm absolutely crazy. <laughs> um, and uh, if people saw oh. it, I'm sure. But then they like cut it and sent the new one in. But it's it's so stupid because it's one of those things that I would never mess up. Like, so why did I mess it up that time? Yeah, right. I, am. Holy. I can't even imagine on that scale. <laughs> on that scale just like messing, <laughs> like that's just like that's like what you have nightmares about like you wake up sweaty that you're gonna do that and then yeah. it happens just like a million Oof. viewers or yeah it's just casual <laughs> like, it's not a big deal yeah. <laughs> so this segment particularly is gonna air before the Fnatic versus mad lions game so we're gonna switch gears a little bit to actual league of legends lec right now so in the past they beat g2 and they beat Fnatic in week week four if mad lions wins what does that mean for Fnatic? uh go? yeah I, go. I i mean i can go i think so so the way i see it is this is fanatics championship to lose and i know that's pretty extreme but like and i know people won't agree but i don't care because i i'm a storyteller right and i also think if you look at an opportunity perspective they have been fighting to get back there for a year now a year and a half and they should take the fact that G2 underperformed as a big signal that they should be able to win this one um, and that their ceiling could be very high with this roster. So if they get knocked out by Mad Lions, like, oh my God, um, it would mean for Fnatic, like, I don't know, I think it would be really bad for kind of probably the roster initially because it would be a big mm -hmm. shock. Because I would hope they would take this as this opportunity as well. Um, and it would be good for the LEC, I guess. Um, or it would be doubt. Because, like, is everyone worse? Or is Mad Lions really good? You know? That is the question. Yeah. yeah that, is, that is the tricky one. Because looking at the Mad Lions G2 games, I think, you know, some of the moves that happened there were moves that uh, Fnatic would never do. And uh, I think uh, in a world where... Fnatic definitely is the favorite after G2's performance. Even looking at some of the games that Fnatic played against G2 in the regular season, there was, one of the games should have been won, but they just forgot to kill a plant, which is silly when you look back at it. Like, if they killed this plant, they would be winning the game. And uh, I think uh, Fnatic, there was still even a consideration if they were the favorites even after regular season because of the, the switch. Uh, but I think everyone was on that G2 hype train because of their 2-0 against Fnatic, which is reasonable. I was on that train too, but now uh, I agree with the notion that it's uh, their championship to lose. I think they need to capitalize on the stars that are aligning in front of them for sure. Mm -hmm. And then wouldn't that also mean that if they lose that, that either G2 and Fnatic, one of them isn't going to be in the final, right? Yeah. That is wild. Yeah. <laughs> that's is, wild. Yeah, that's a, a crazy. So like, yeah, it really is their championship to lose for sure. And they would have a very different finals in that case. Um, who do you think is the team to watch right now? Go, oh, uh, Imano. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, uh, Mad Lions was my dark horse. Like, I think if there was, was any team that is going to cause shock, it was definitely uh, Mad Lions. Uh, I think uh, every other matchup was clear which team is going to win. Like, for example, OG versus Rogue, I can like, almost like, put all my money on the fact that OG is going to take it home. 
they're probably going to cut this and re-record because we are airing this on a different day. Uh, so maybe I'm going to be in trouble. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I think OG is going to win that. And then OG between G2. I think G2 is going to win that. I think it's easy to predict. Mad Lions is kind of all over the place and it seems to greatly benefit them that everything is happening online. I think ever since that game against Origin in the regular season, I think they showcase that uh, the meta is in a perfect place for them because they are, have a really strong bot lane. They can play almost anything. Humanoid seems super comfortable. Like the whole meme about Humanoid dies just seems to have disappeared. And I think without that inconsistency, Humanoid is one of the best mid laners uh, in Europe in the current meta because he can kind of play whatever he wants with the Zoe, LeBlanc, and, and Azir and so forth. So I think Mad Lions definitely can cause some shock. But I think in terms of quality, I think Fnatic... Uh, even though the OG series uh, was kind of all over the place because two games Origin drafted really poorly, I think Fnatic showed the highest level of class and class is what interests me in league and I think Fnatic uh, is the team you watch for class. But then again, G2, you know, we are kind of uh, under the radar with them now because of the series against Mad Lions, but maybe G2 is super, super angry now and all of a sudden after this weekend, we think of them as a favorite again. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Um... I'd have to say, obviously, Mad Lions, uh, the whole like rookie thing in Europe. I mean, people are probably tired of hearing it, but it's insane. And of course, so much has to do with the fact that the local, the regional leagues are thriving um, because you can just hear a clear line every time from one of the leagues to stars in the LEC who then go on to Worlds and stuff. It's actually crazy. Um, but in general, like the Mad Lion story, the Fnatic and the G2 story and kind of the way they play is so contrasted to the way a Rogue plays and an OG plays, right? Which is distinctly slower team play oriented to the late game and the mid game and whatnot. Um, and I see in Mad, in Fnatic and in G2, just the willingness to fight and be aggressive early and also to take the opportunities whenever you can get them. Um, and I think that's where kind of the, the global meta has evolved to as well and that's how the most successful teams have played i mean look at the two two teams in the world championship final last year right um and i think there's going to be a clear demarcation line of those teams thriving and the slower teams not thriving um i think and that's why i'm very interested in specifically og uh, to see how they will do because i also think they'll beat rogue um but you know, we, we keep thinking, is this all they can do? Is this the best they can do? Are they going to be the slow team that's forever third? Um, I'm afraid so for now. So I'm like, I'm excited to see what they come out with if they do play G2, because it's going to be really freaking hard. Mm -hmm. So finals, who do you think it's going to be? If you were to put your, your money where your mouth is. Not a G2. <laughs> Fnatic I think Fnatic G2. G2. I think G2 is going to beat uh, Mad Lions in the, in the rematch. Sadly, for Mad yep. Lions, so but uh, happily for G2 fans. Then... Yay. <laughs> yep. So we, we think in the end, it'll end up being the classic rivalry, the Kings of Europe, the normal matchup. Uh, oh. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, <laughs> I the thing is, I would also not be surprised if the Mad Lions beat Fnatic because it just happened, right? Lightning just struck. Yeah. Um, the thing is, I often get really, I get influenced by my colleagues a lot. So um my color casters Yamato included they watch a lot of odds very intently and of course know much more about the game than me so i get into a meeting uh on wednesday it's like all right let's talk about the mad lions and then someone comes in and it's like g2 played like absolute ass <laughs> and it's like <laughs> well yes but <laughs> someone has to catch the throw and you can't take anything away from the way they've played because Shadow was a monster. Like Yanko's even admitted that he outplayed him and stuff. And it's hard to see the balance because you're never really going to know 100% how well they've played and how bad the opponent played. But they beat them and nobody else in Europe has been able to do that in a best of five in, in this iteration of G2. So you got to take that and you got to give them the credit they deserve. So um, unfortunately, though, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's that fanatic also, that fan hive mind. I don't know. It's hard to count them out. It's hard to count them out. It is hard to count them out. Well, I'm excited to watch that series. And that pretty much wraps up our time together. So I want to thank you guys so much for being here with me today. Thank you. And thank we'll you. see you guys next time.